Welcome, Simon, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Hey, no worries. Not, uh, nice to be talking to you, Ryan. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, before we get into it, I'd love it if you give a quick introduction about yourself and the company to our audience. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, Simon Ford, based in um, Cambridge in the UK, been in the IoT um, business a long time, I guess, uh, um, working at ARM originally through Cortex-A, Cortex-M microcontroller platforms, IoT software and things like that. And now uh, working at uh, Bleacon, where we're building to low energy uh, based IoT connectivity. We've talked about BLE in the past a while ago, but we haven't covered it kind of recently and where where things are today. I'd love it if maybe we could start with having you just give a quick introduction to what Bluetooth Low Energy is compared to just Bluetooth in general, how people think about it, and then kind of where it stands now versus maybe where it was you know 12 months ago. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, so Bluetooth is this amazingly well-known brand. Um, it's been around for years, um, but a project sort of around... Um, you know, Nokia and Ericsson and people like that in the early days of mobile phones um, called Wybri, um, developed into something called Bluetooth Low Energy and actually became part of the standard. Um, and as the name reflects, it was much more focused on really low cost, low uh, energy devices. But I guess what's interesting about Bluetooth Low Energy in particular is it, it kind of got a free ride on, on uh, phones and laptops and things like that by being very um, low cost to implement into what was existing Bluetooth silicon. So they're actually quite different technologies, but, but very cheap to um, add into the designs that are already there. So by that um, fact, it actually uh, you know, is one of the fastest growing wireless standards ever. The, you know, the rate of adoption of that technology um, was amazing. Um, and as you say, I think most people will perhaps know it um, for sort of personal peripherals, things like keyboards, mice, um, things like that. Um, but I guess what's interesting uh, well, certainly to us um, and to uh, people who are looking to apply it in industry in sort of, I guess, non-consumer applications is because it, it got that free ride and because of the economies of scale it achieved, it's actually just an amazing technology if you can apply it to some, some different use cases. More recently, I mean, there's some, been some really interesting additions to um, the standard. It's, it's developed um, a lot over the years. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, we always think of it as like hiding in plain sight. It's one of those standards that just keeps on chugging away and, and getting better and better. Um, got some really interesting um, features around audio broadcasting um, added to it recently in AuraCast. Other things that can, uh, for things like direction finding and distance measurements. This growth in um, consumer that, that made the economies what they are and made the global adoption what they are it is, you know, even just that basics of that technology being applied into these different applications, I think is, is kind of what's, I mean, it's certainly what's really exciting for us. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a really cool space to follow. Just, you know, I, I mean, I've been in the IoT space for eight years or so now and just watching connectivity technologies, you know, mature and evolve and some go away, some improve, you know, all that kind of good stuff. It's been great. I think, you know, com- people having more options and more sophisticated technologies to make some of these use cases plausible that were not before is is the best thing that could possibly happen for the industry, um, amongst other things, obviously. Could you talk to us a little bit about some particular use cases that companies are using BLE4 when it comes to being the choice for the IoT connectivity piece of a solution? As you're um, highlighting, Bluetooth's been around and people recognize it for those consumer use cases. So sort of, you know, pairing a, a health tracker to your phone or something like that. What's really interesting is Bluetooth has got some quite impressive and, and unique features. So uh, things like being able to advertise. Um, so actually, if you look at, if you looked around you and you scanned around you, there's, there's probably 50, 100 devices are all advertising their existence. And actually, a technology like that um, perhaps originally got the interest of people like Apple and Google for marketing purposes. So you walk into a shop and it, it discovers you're there and you know, it gives you a promotion for your Starbucks or something like that. Um, and that's, again, how a technology like that got adopted into all these different operating systems. Um, but then, you know, then industry caught on and went, well, hang on, let, you know, let's, let's not track uh, the user, let's track an object. Let, let's make the thing that has the Bluetooth device the thing that's moving, not the thing that's static. Um, yeah, so so one sort of killer application for Bluetooth low energy um, in this space is is um, has been asset tracking, and and um, yeah, the fact that these devices at incredibly low power can advertise their existence, and you know that be detected by a phone or a dedicated piece of hardware or something like that, kind of kind of really took off quite quite quietly. I don't, I don't think until things like AirTags came around, maybe Tile or something like that, people knew it in the consumer space. But, but yeah, there's, there's billions of these devices being used to understand where things are. Um, 
and then yeah, as you say, what what are the use cases from that? Well, you know, knowing where something is 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 all well and good, but actually, often what you're looking to do is understand um, not just where it is, but what it's doing or what it's been doing. Um, and that's kind of where it gets exciting for us is where you know this sort of this beacon technology starts maturing beyond, I guess, you know, what got popularized as a marketing use case into um, really being um, well requiring like secure data transfer and and, and things like that. So so objects or products can start communicating back to base about, um, you know, through a supply chain, when, when did something go out of condition or if it's a product, how is it being used? When is it being used? Um, or, or, or then getting on to obviously managing a device, being able to update it and in, improve the firmware, but, but all when you can, you know, hit a very, very low cost. Yeah, I've heard about it in like uh, in the from an indoor asset tracking standpoint within hospitals and medical kind of situations. We're trying to figure out if it's going to be a good option to use for tracking medical devices and, and different kinds of things within the hospital setting. Um, you know, ultra wideband is something people use, but the cost associated with that wasn't always something easy to digest. So I, I've heard companies working with Bluetooth really trying to figure out how they can efficiently do indoor asset tracking, which is kind of like has always been a big thing, a big challenge for, for people in IoT, uh, especially on the enterprise side, for sure. And I think what's um, sort of exciting to us is knowing where something is, is part of the problem, but actually knowing what it's doing is is really where, where it gets quite interesting. And um, yeah, you, you're exactly right that there, there's a load of technologies that have um, uh, been explored recently, ultra wideband being one, but other things added to Bluetooth standard, like angle of arrival, angle of departure, and channel sounding for better positioning. Um, it's a really interesting area, and I think there's a there's some really uh, good companies working on that sort of the localization problem. What's exciting to us is where people are starting to think, well, actually, if I knew what, what my products in the field were doing, or if I knew how my environments were behaving, I could make better decisions, or I could, you know, I could improve the system, right? Yeah, location is sort of like the baseline. If you know where your um, product is, I think that's very exciting. But then you start to have an insight, which, to be honest, the SaaS guys have had for the last 10 years, right? Any SaaS company now wouldn't be um, wouldn't be where they were if they didn't understand how their product was being used or being able to deploy improvements to their product um, as they needed to. So uh, I think I think the embedded industry is just going to follow. What about on the opposite side of that? What are some of the challenges that companies have had using BLE for IoT connectivity for these solutions? Great question. Yeah. So yeah, the the obvious benefits, right? People are looking for low cost, or they're looking for low power, or it to be small, or just the ubiquity of the technology, right? It's everywhere. This is the reasons why they're trying to apply it, right? And um, but then where where you get stuck is things like actually the fundamental architecture, right? So as a technologist, you wouldn't necessarily build an IO connectivity architecture in the way that Bluetooth Low Energy is designed. It's it's designed as that cable replacement concept, right? It's you pair a device and it's like you plugged this in, you know, it's like you plugged your keyboard into your um, computer. It's just that it was wireless. And, and, and that, that whole concept is great for peripherals. But if you think of IoT connectivity like cellular technologies or LoRa technologies or anything like that, it's generally about a device anywhere, wherever it happens to be, being able to talk home. Um, so that sort of pairing concept doesn't quite work. The device kind of wants to be in charge. It doesn't want to be a slave to a computer or something like that. It, it's the thing that wants to communicate. Um, so yeah, the, what you find is um, the technologist wouldn't necessarily design it like this, but the pragmatist wants to use Bluetooth because of all the, the, the benefits. Um, so yeah, you, you find companies effectively having to work around the, the core architecture and build you know, a different security transport that is more appropriate or trying to work around how, how would you avoid pairing so that a device could you know, migrate between hotspots or, or something like that. Um, so th there's those sorts of things. Um, and I guess um, there's, there's some range considerations as well. So I, I guess when most people think of Bluetooth, they think five meters or something like that. It's your headphones. Reality is it's, you know, as long as the antenna is designed well and things like that, you know, 50, 100 meters is fine. And we've, we've got people experimenting up to a kilometer and things like that. But realistically, it is a relatively short-ranged radio. And that's when you start to, when you look over at cellular, well, what, what, sort of, what sort of technologies and inspiration do you take from there? Well, it's things like mobility. To be able to roam, you, know, you can roam between hotspots or you can, um, a, a device, as it's moving through a supply chain, might want to talk um, you know, to a different backend by different access points and things like that. So it's kind of all these sort of architectural things 
um, that to be honest, they're, you know, that they're, they're not rocket science, but they are quite complicated. Um, you, you need someone who knows security. You need someone who knows um, topology and all these sorts of things. So yeah, that, that, I mean, yeah, in the, the my time at Arm, I spent a lot of time with a lot of companies building <laughs> building things. And when they were building with Bluetooth in this sort of area, you know, that's the teams they were skipping up um, to to build those sort of things. And you can only see that so many times before getting frustrated and think, oh, you know, I might go and fix this. Let me ask you, we've covered some pretty high level, like really the basics I think are super important here. When, when we're talking about BLE, how does it also play into other trends that we're seeing with AI at the edge? We've talked about ML on here, things that we listed ahead of time were energy um, scavenging and then miniaturization. Like, How are those trends or how is, I guess, BLE playing a role in those trends? Yeah, the three trends that you're talking about there, you know, that, that's going to evolve over the next five, 10 years. AI on the edge is an interesting one. You know, so there's a lot, a lot of devices that uh, they want to do sensing. They want to understand something about their domain. Maybe they've got ho- quite high bandwidth inputs and obviously sending data over radios is expensive. So you often want to distill that down to something that's really quite high level concepts, right? You know, that's how you get efficiency in the system. And, you know, th- thanks to, you know, companies like ARM and, and the, all the silicon guys actually doing processing in a tiny wireless device now is incredibly efficient. So if you can do edge processing to reduce the amount of data you send, that's amazing. But at the same time, you actually need to be collecting data to be able to train your models. You need to be able to push new models down to the edge to um, you know, up- update as you find anomalies and things like that. So Bluetooth is kind of uniquely placed there, I think, um, in the sense that it can be really low cost, um, low bandwidth, low power as a radio standard. So when you're sending the information that you want, you know, the, the high level data, um, it can be incredibly efficient at that. But then you can also ramp it up to actually be you know, a, a decent bandwidth to push a new model down or to, to get the training data from the field um, rather than just from the lab. And actually, when you look at a lot of low power radios, often they don't have that bandwidth that they're disposable. Um, so it has to be a lot of lab testing and stuff like that. So I think, yeah, the, and, and the combo of sort of Bluetooth and quite powerful micros I mean, there's tens of silicon vendors making them now. So as a designer, um, it's a great combo. Yeah, when you come to miniaturization and energy scavenging, again, I think Bluetooth is, is quite uniquely placed here. When you're dealing with energy scavenging, you're really looking to reduce power. You know, it, it is maturing as a technology now. I mean, it's real. It's, it's not widespread, I wouldn't say yet, but it is real. If you, if you go and look at what people are doing with energy scavenging, they're generally using Bluetooth low energy. Why is that? Well, because it meets the power profile. But why are you energy scavenging? Well, you're probably trying to get costs down as well. You're trying to avoid having batteries. You're trying to avoid sending someone out to re- replace batteries. And actually, the, you know, there isn't really any cheaper mainstream radios than Bluetooth. So you can see it kind of that whole miniaturization, whether it's printed batteries, um, you know, flexible electronics, um, things like that. And the energy scavenging, I think, yeah, is, is going to really play. I mean, it's certainly something we're betting on. It's, it's not the market now. Um, it's, it's a latent market. It's, it's emerging. It's, you know, it's getting real, but it's not widespread. But yeah, uh, I guess what's exciting for us is, you know, as, as the, you know, the use of Bluetooth in these sort of IoT connective use cases grows, you've got this new wave kind of, yeah, battery free or fabric or embedded, um, you know, technology. It's just like, it's almost just smuggled in the corner of a product or a, you know, a medical device or something like that. It's really, it's quite impressive what's going on and you can kind of get to see in, what's going to happen in the next five, 10 years. Yeah. If we look at the next 12, 18, 24 months, anything kind of that you're really excited for in this space or people should be kind of paying attention to? Well, I think there's two things. Yeah. Like, like you say, that um, there's, there's what I was talking about, this sort of f- five years out thing. I think a lot of that technology is going to start to f- feel very real. Um, so people are going to contemplate, you know, perhaps products that they couldn't have imagined um, before, so that that's really interesting, but that that's still quite you know science, I suppose. I guess what's interesting for us shorter term is we're just seeing more and more people becoming quite pragmatic about IoT, and you know the the use cases that they're, they're, they're understood, um, but it's not about the science anymore. So you know, yes, there was a rush of radio technologies, yes, there's a rush of um, all these different things, but. You know, a lot of the companies we talk to at the moment, they're, they're pretty pragmatic about stuff. And they're thinking, not just technically, they're thinking about economics. They're thinking about cost of deployment. They're thinking about um, you know, the reality of taking something to market. 
um, distributing it through a supply chain and all those sorts of things. And um, you know, that's quite exciting because um, you know this industry behind the scenes is growing crazily, even if it's not so visible. Um, but it's nice to see that it's it's just going to keep <laughs> keep on that trajectory. And that's why certainly building this business, I, I feel like it's an amazing time to be doing it. Actually, yeah, a lot of the research has been done. A lot of the use cases have been, you know, somewhat proved out, and and now it's um, about making them more practical for people, especially on the enterprise side. Like they can add affordable costs, the ROI is more clear, it's easier to deploy, all the stuff that just makes you get to scale more, you know, more easy or make it easier, right? So and the spillover of um, sort of consumer expectations into the industrial side is very exciting for us because actually cost of deployment become is a barrier. A lot of projects have uh, we we saw failed because. Yes, conceptually the product was great, but when it came to deploy it, it was um, you know it hit barriers of complexity in training and these sorts of things. But if you can sort of consumerize the product, even though it's not for a consumer market, you can really change the cost structure. And I think um, that combined with the cost of hardware rem- continuing to go down means a lot of services services businesses, which are really what a lot of IoT businesses are, are not going to have that upfront. You know, hardware cost or deployment cost that is the barrier to them giving value to their customers. So that it properly becoming a service model and a service industry is is really exciting prospect. I think. So, um, where can our audience learn more about the company? What you all have going on? Follow up with questions, any of that kind of stuff. I also saw that you all are, are hiring too. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the company is called Bleakin. Um, we have a website bleakin.net, and and you can obviously reach out to us there or um, follow us on LinkedIn and, and things like that, um, or set up a call if you want to um, chat with us. Uh, we'll actually be over at Embedded World um, in Austin in October, so that will be great. And yeah, we are we are hiring. We're still a small uh, team, but we're hiring super guru uh, people. So if you think you're one of those people, reach out. But also working with a whole range of sort of design partners, design consultancies that are looking to build products with their customers. You know, it's it's great to talk to them. We're a product company. We love working with design consultancies that are in there solving the depths of of a customer's problem. So if you fit into that category, it'd be um, amazing to talk to you. Yeah. Well, Simon, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Um, excited to get this out to our audience. And if um, you know we can help out in any way in the future, let us know. Hopefully we can find some time to, to talk further, maybe later this year or into next year about kind of the state of the BLE space and what you have going on over there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that'd be amazing. Thanks for your time, Ryan. That was brilliant.